Now, have you ever attended a conference or a convention? There are conventions or conferences covering all types of topics. Some, some of them relate to professions, so you may have been to a conference a convention related to your profession, or maybe a hobby, a life skill, or something that you, and I've certainly been to conferences and conventions, that we're interested in. And after that conference or convention, we normally come back home with something. We come back home with something, maybe physical, like a sample, or souvenir, or something that we received while there at the conference or convention. We come back with memories. We can tell stories to our family, our, our co-workers, our fellow students, our neighbors of what we experienced, of what we enjoyed when we were there. And we also bring back pictures as well that help us with those memories. And then there are intangible things that we come back with. Maybe we come back encouraged. It's intangible. I can't put encouragement or be encouraged on a table and say, there it is. It's intangible. But yet it's something very important. Maybe it's excitement. Maybe it's hope. And a little less than two weeks ago, we came back from the feast. And you and I most likely brought back something from the feast. We brought back physical things, maybe it's a souvenir, maybe it's a ticket stub of an event you went to. We brought back memories, memories of places you went, people you met, activities you attended, and then you brought back intangibles, things you can't physically put your hand around but definitely is important. And whether you were able to attain the feast in person this year, or you had to tune in through the webcast, you definitely brought back home something with you from the feast. And if you think about this feast and even years gone by, we did bring back something. And I want to focus on one thing that I think and hope and I believe we all came back with, an intangible but yet it's something so important that it will motivate us in how we live our lives in the coming year. Turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Now let's go to verse 20. This is a long prayer of Jesus as he's speaking to the Father, as he is facing his final night, about to be arrested, betrayed by Judas and arrested. And he's praying to the Father and breaking into that prayer in verse 20, John 17. I do not pray for these alone. So those who were around him, his disciples around him, but also those who will believe in me through their word. He is including you, and he's including me in this prayer. Verse 21, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and you, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Christ prayed, prayed that we would be one. One with the Father, one with Christ, but one with each other. You can jot down John chapter 10, verse 30, where Christ says, I and my Father are one. And at the feast this year, and think of all past years, we attended and we did things together. We ate together. We went to activities together. In Barbados, where we attended the feast, we could go downstairs to the restaurant and have breakfast with members, having breakfast together. And we could have conversations today with one, one member or one family, and tomorrow 
another family. We created new friendships. We built existing ones. We served together. We sung together. We attended service together. Being one. And I hope that that is something we all came home with. The feeling of being one. And that motivates us and continues to motivate us to be one for the rest of our lives. To be one with the Father, the one with Jesus Christ, and the one with each other. Now, I'm going to focus primarily on being one with each other. But definitely by extension, that means being one with Christ and being one with the Father. But as we read in scriptures, we cannot say that we love God and hate our brother. So we can't say we are at one with God and not in one with our brother or sister. So when it comes to being at one, there are five areas. Now I must say I run the risk of stating that there are five, that I do state five, <laughs> but we'll see. There are five areas I want us to consider about being one. The first area is being one in way of thinking. Being at one in way of thinking. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Let's go down to verse 11. Second Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace be with you. Being of one mind, a way of thinking, an approach. Now, this is not saying that we all have to think exactly the same way. We all like the same car, we all like the same food, and we think the same words exactly. But it's saying there's a mindset and approach that leads to what? Living in peace. Living in God's love. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Now we're going to be reading some large section of scriptures as we go through so that we get the context and the picture that's being painted. And we get to see that being one together is an important topic in the Bible. Philippians chapter 2, going to verse 1. Philippians 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So the way we think towards each other, with each other, leads to love. Leaves in, leads to being in one accord. Let's read more of what it leads to, of being of the same mind, the same way of thinking. Verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. So as we grow in oneness with each other, that human nature that brings selfishness, that human nature that brings Conceit and deceit is put away, is diminished. And as we grow in one accord and one mind, here's what it's leading to, continuing verse 3. But in lowliness of mind, let us esteem others better than himself. That applies to all of us. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. So that's what we're looking at. As we are thinking, or the way we think, must match the way Christ would think. And if we think the way Christ will think, then we will start producing the fruits. 
that Christ is expecting us to have. Verse 6, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. Or likeness of man. So number one, as we come back from the feast and we recognize the oneness we experience at the feast, let's bring that back home. Apply it in our lives. Keep it burning. Keep it on the forefront of our mind and we grow, we grow to be one in the way we think. Another area in growing in oneness as a body, as a church, growing at, in one in speech. For, go, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Being at one in speech. 1 Corinthians 1. Let's go down to verse 10. Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 1. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there is no divisions among you, but, the, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Once again, here we're not saying that we all speak exactly the same words, the same phrase, the same accent, the same whatever with respect to the technical aspect of speaking, but we speak in the same way in terms of judgment, in terms of applying God's law so that there's no division among us. So that it didn't matter who came to any of us in this room and asked us the same question about God's law we would say the same thing. Not necessarily the same exact words, but we would say the same thing because we are one with each other. We are one with the Father. We are one with Christ, and therefore our speech would be the same. Dropping down to verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now I say this, that each of you says... I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? We can let personalities, we can let views cause division. When really the focus is on being of the same mind, making the same judgment. So as we speak with one another and as we speak with others, they can see that we are of the same mind. We say the same thing. We apply the same judgments because we are applying the same laws, the same precepts of God. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read a lengthy passage here. Ephesians 4. Let's go down to verse 17. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. And wherever you went for the feast, I am sure on your way back home, you were reminded of the futility of this world's mind. Whether it be going through an airport, whether it be driving on the highway, whether it be stopping for gas, whether it be driving into your neighborhood or walking into your workplace, you were reminded of the futility of the mind of this world. 
And the scripture tells us we no longer walk in that way. We no longer think that way. We no longer speak that way. Verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being annihilated from the, light, from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart. We don't ridicule them. We just know they don't understand. But as we came back, we were reminded of the sway of Satan in this world. Verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. In other words, when, we were, when the truth was revealed to us, we understood that the way of the world is not the way we live. He did not tell us, now that you understand the truth, continue living the way of the world. He said, no longer walk that path. If indeed you have heard him, verse 21, if indeed you have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And the feast reminded us of a promise that is ours if we do put off this old man, if we do put off this corruption and put on Christ. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on a new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Verse 25, therefore, so we're leading into something. Therefore, verse 25, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth to his neighbor for we are members of one another. Remember, there's the letter of the law, and then there's the spirit of the law. So we're reading the letter, put away lying, but we also have to recognize the spirit of the law. We tell the truth in what we say. As I said before, if someone came and asked each of us separately, Something according to the way we live, how to apply God's word and what's right or wrong, they would get the same answer. We are at one in speech. Verse 26, be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down in your, on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So whatever we say imparts grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemp redemption. Verse 32, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And sometimes our words aren't perfect. Sometimes we say things the wrong way or imply something we didn't imply. And we must be willing to be tender-hearted, to be willing to forgive one another, recognizing that as we were made one with God the Father and with Jesus Christ, they forgave us. When we cried out to, that, to God the Father and said, forgive our sins, apply the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And therefore, if our brothers and sisters say something they really didn't mean, and they apologize for, we're willing to be tender-hearted, to be forgiving. So we're being one in speech. Number three, third aspect of being one as a body, as a church, being one with God the Father, Jesus Christ. Being one in action. Being one in action. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12.
As I said before, we're going to be reading some lengthy passages because it's important to set the context, especially when we're talking the topic of being in one, what, it's, what it means, and then what is the outcome? What, are, what results should we be getting or seeing? Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more mighty than he ought to think, but to think soberly according, to the, according as God has dealt to every man or woman the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, same responsibilities, same gifts. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of each other. We are all individual. We all have our own characteristics. We are all a single member, but part of one body, the body of Christ. Verse six, having then gifts Differing according to the grace that is given to us. Every one of us has been given a gift through God's mercy. Whether it be prophecy, then let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teach on teaching. And he that exhorts on exhorting, he that gives, let him do it with simplicity. He that rules with diligence, he that shows mercy with cheerfulness. Whatever gift, whatever ability, whatever we can do, and that applies to every one of us, we do it because we are one in the body of Christ. Verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Our actions should show this. Our actions should show affection, kindness to one another, brotherly love giving away to a brother or sister in the body of Christ. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope. Here's the actions that should be evident as we are one with each other. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing instant in prayer. There are many who need prayers. They need to know that we are with them. That they are part of us. Continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. Action. Doing something. Seeing to the needs of those who have a need. Some, might be, some needs might be made public. Some might be private, but as we become aware and we have the ability to do, we do what we can for the needs of our brothers and sisters, and we're given to hospitality. I certainly hope that you enjoyed all the fellowship you had at the feast. I know my family did. From talking to the little children who would come up and talk to us, to the oldest members in the church, who would talk about what happened many, many years ago, and you just sit down and you listen, and you enjoy the conversation, and you learn. And sometimes you hear a phrase, something that encourages you. Verse 14. Bless them who persecute you. Bless and not curse. And sometimes that's a challenge because sometimes a brother hurts or a sister hurts, does something, says something. And the human nature inside wants to come up and curse rather 
then bless. But as remember that we are all one. Then we bless rather than curse. Verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Those who rejoice can tell that their brothers and their sisters in Christ are rejoicing with them. And those who mourn can tell that they have brothers and sisters in this one body who mourn and weep with them. And even if it's all we can do is sign the cards at the back, cards of encouragement, that still communicates to our brothers and sisters in this country and around the world that we are one. And we take that simple action to communicate to them, we are with you. Verse 16, be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not the high things, the high and lofty things. But to the men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceit. And it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to think of self. And the challenge here that we learned at the feast and we come back home with is learn to be considerate of others, to think of others, to prepare to rule with Jesus Christ. And his character is not self. His character is give. Not thinking of his own power. And we must think the same way. Verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible, as much as lies with you, live, live peaceably with all men. What is the picture being painted here through all these verses? is that we are building a oneness with each other. That while there may be human nature still in us, and we're not going to get rid of it completely until we're changed, that we are striving to be one. And we're striving to do the things that show that we are one. So number three, being one in action. So I'll have another set of scriptures on this point. Let's turn over to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, and let's go to verse 1. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which, with which you were called. In other words, live the life that you've been called to. The actions must reflect the calling to which we were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, forbearing with one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ. Verse 11. For he himself has given some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. There is a purpose for this. For the equipping of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. In other words, we all become one. In the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Whatever roles we play, it may not include standing up at a lectern 
but it may mean Sabbath school, it may mean teen, it may mean camp, it may mean a, some club, it may mean something. Where you need, where we are called upon to display the unity of the Spirit, where we're called upon to work together, where we're called upon to have the actions that show we are one. Verse 14. That we are no longer, verse 14 of uh, Ephesians 4, that we, are, that we shall no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away with every wind of doctrine. And we do have to be careful of that. It is so easy to be exposed to all sorts of thoughts, ideas, to be convinced of something different than what God would have us think and believe. By the trickery of man, by the cunning craftiness of deceit. But, this is what we should be doing instead. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ. From whom the whole body join and knit together by what the joint supplies according to the effective working. By which every part does its share. Every part. That's you. That's me. We all have a part to play. Some are visible. Some are not visible. But still an important part. Sending a card to someone who is going through a trial is just as important as someone who's leading a group in the church somewhere or giving a message. Making a phone call to a widow or widower to check on them. Is just as important as anything else we can do in the church. Each one of us doing our part, causing growth of the body for the edification of itself in love. Our actions display our oneness. Let's turn over now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I think you're beginning to see that the point of being one, living as one, behaving as one, being in one with Christ and Jesus Christ and each other is an important point. Is an important characteristic we must have. We're not reading one or two verses here. We're reading several verses that paint the picture that is important for us to be at one. And it's something that I hope we all came back from the feast dedicated to continue to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I will not have you ignorant. You know that you know that you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols as you were led. Therefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Christ accursed. Verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. The idea of being one. Yes, there are differences, but it's all working for one goal. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are differences in operations, but it is the same God which works all in all. Verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, another faith by the same Spirit, another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, another the working of miracles, and another prophecy, and another discerning spirits, and another diverse tongues, and another the interpretation of tongues. You see, individuals have different gifts. You have, and I have. God has given them to us. But what is the purpose? Verse 11. But all these work. To what end? But all these work that one and the same Spirit. They work to one. 
not divided to one. So point number three, being at one in action. Point number four, aspect number four, being at one in experience. We're going to still stay in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go down to verse 12. Being one in experience. For as the body is one and many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. As you looked around the room at the feast site you attended, as you look around this meeting room, we are all one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all having been made to drink of the one spirit. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter our historical background, our family background, our medical history, our financial status, our social status, how many friends we've got on social media, whether we even do social media at all. It doesn't matter. We are one body. Verse 14. For in fact, the body that is not... Let me read that again. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. Meaning the body has many members. If the foot says, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it not therefore not of the body? And there may be times we might think that. There may be times where we can see someone might maybe can seem to do a lot. And maybe we can think that we can't do much. But as I read before, God has given us gifts. God has given us abilities, each one of us, and we use them not worrying about what someone else is able to do. So while maybe I'm in a financial situation and I can't help somebody financially, I can still give them a call. I can still greet them at church and give them a hug. Maybe I don't know how to repair a member's car, but maybe I can give them the name of someone I trust. Or maybe I can do something that's within my ability to help another member rather than say, I, have, I am of no value, or I have little value. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole, and if the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set each member, each one of them, in the body as he pleases. What's the picture being painted here? Oneness, but made up of many members. That's you. And that's me. And if there were all one member, where, the, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. So here you have the opposite. First we read, oh, I am not worth much. I cannot do much. Therefore, I'm not going to do anything. Now we're reading, Oh, I can do much more than you, so therefore you are nothing. We're reading here, that's not the approach we are to have as one body. Verse 21, And I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which may seem to be weaker are necessary. And whether you consider yourself weaker or not, recognize that every one of you are necessary in this body. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks that honor. 
that there should, verse 25, that there should be no chism in the body, separation, division. But the members should have the same care one to another. And hopefully you experience this at the feast. You experience people stepping forward and volunteering in different areas. Helping out. Now let's bring that back home and do that. Taking care of others. Looking out for each other. Saying we are one. We are one body. And if one member suffers, verse 26, and this is where I got the, the, the point of being one in experience. And if one member suf suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice. And we can rejoice with the family that had their little one blessed today. Because they are members of this body. And we can rejoice with them. And those who are suffering, we suffer with them. Now you are the body of Christ. We are one, but members individually. And area number five, being at one in purpose. Being at one in purpose. 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians two. Let's go to verse nine. Being at one in purpose. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the hearts of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the Spirit teaches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And as we observe the feast, we learned, we were reminded, we were encouraged of the things God has planned for us. Not only us, but for all of mankind. And we say, yes, I see that vision. I see that purpose for my life. I see that purpose for the life of all human beings, including my brothers and sisters. And therefore, we live our lives with that one purpose in mind. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. That's you. And that's me. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 3. Chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. And really, this last area or this last point drives the others. Because the purpose in which we live our lives drives how we live, what we say, how we behave how we react to good things, how we react to bad things, how we respond to sins, our own sins and the sins of others. It is dependent on the purpose that we see for our lives. Philippians 3, verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. We were inspired to reach forward to what's ahead. To not look back. I press, verse 14, I press forward to the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. Have this mind. Pressing forward to the goal, to the prize that's set before us. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even to you. Verse 16, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. So see, this points us back to, if we have this purpose, it's going to direct what we say. It's going to direct how we behave. It's going to direct how we think. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk also as you have us for a pattern. Let's drop down to verse 20. Verse 18 and verse 19 talks about those who walk differently. And towards the end of verse 19, it states what drives their mind, what drives their behavior. They set their mind on earthly things. So we're going to contrast that with verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even so to subdue all things to himself. That's what we're looking forward to. And that's what we came back filled with, looking forward for the return of Christ, looking forward for that citizenship when we are welcomed into his kingdom. So we live our lives with that purpose. And we work with each other with that purpose in mind. And we become one with that purpose in mind. But recognize that sometimes it will not be easy because we have an adversary. We have someone who's not focused on oneness and togetherness and unity, but focuses on division, strife, envy. So as we continue to grow in oneness as a body, Individually and collectively, let us consider these aspects of becoming one. Christ showed through how he lived that he was one with the Father. And he is still one with the Father. And he wants us to be one with him and the Father as we read in John. He, shows, he has shown us and wants us to be one with each other in our thinking. He wants us to be one with each other in our speech. He wants us to be one with each other in our actions. He wants us to be one with each other in our experiences. And he wants us to be one with each other in purpose. So now we come back and we dedicate ourselves to live that character of the same oneness that's in Christ and God the Father. And it should be displayed and evident to all. I was watching a sermon by Mr. Scott Lord. Uh, don't re recall which church area. But uh, last week he mentioned that at the feast where some staff member commented about the members attending the feast. And they were different. They were different than others who've come to that area. And you and I know that that has been a statement made about God's people throughout the years, decades, many places around the world. And I, even though I wasn't there, as I experienced in the Feast in Barbados, and you can think about where you were this year, what they saw was togetherness. What they saw was a oneness. What they saw was a focus on a purpose in life, and everyone was working together with that purpose in mind. So therefore, it reflected in our speech. It reflected in our behavior. It reflected in how we reacted and interacted with each other.
So now that we're back from the feast and we've brought back our physical things, souvenirs, memories, we've brought back some intangible things, some things that are very important. There was a purpose for going to the feast. You can jot down Leviticus 23, verse 42 to 43. Leviticus 23, 42 to 43. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And we can reflect that God has brought us out of this world. He has shown us his purpose, his vision, which is our vision. And he is our God. And if he is our God, it means we need to be at one with him. And if we are at one with God, we are at one with each other. Our sermonette speaker, Mark Croft, about a year ago, in July last year, gave a message on a psalm that I want to close with, Psalm 133. Psalm 133. And it might be beneficial to look that message back up. It's, it is online. I checked on it last night. It describes a visual of what the result of being one looks like. We have a hymn. In fact, we sang it as our first hymn. wasn't planned, but we sang it as our first hymn. A very good visual of what oneness looks like amongst us, amongst the people of God. Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. And I hope for almost every day of the feast this year, you were able to think that in your mind as you looked around the congregation. How pleasant it is for us to be together in unity. Let's do that here. Let's do that in our congregations wherever we are around this world. As we look around our local congregations, that we can say how pleasant it is to be together. How pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded a blessing. And what's that blessing? Life forevermore. That's the promise as we live what Christ prayed. I pray not for these, but those who believe because of them, including you and me, that they may be one just as I and you and the Father, I and the Father are one. So as we share our stories, our experiences from the feast this year, or even from previous years, let us be joyful. Let us be thankful and let us also commit to continue this lesson that we brought home from the feast of being unified, of being in unity to each other and with each other, being at one with each other, with God the Father and with Jesus Christ.